with you. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Today is the Sunday we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. What does his baptism mean for him? And what implications does it have for us that Jesus was baptized like we are? We'll be thinking about that this morning. Um, a couple of birthday, well, one birthday, Louise Cranbill will be celebrating a birthday on the 12th of January. Lois and Lawrence Claybaum are celebrating an anniversary on the 12th of January. Uh, January. So uh, let's take a moment to stand and greet each other. And if you're comfortable, wave to the camera uh, to let people know you're here. Wave to the people in the balcony and to Eunice um, as we celebrate this day. All right. Let's begin with our opening hymn, When All the World Was Cursed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My friends in Christ, in holy baptism, each of us was baptized into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In baptism, we were united with Christ. Yet we have often lived as if we were entirely independent and autonomous. We have lived as if our identity were not in Jesus but in our own selfish desires. Yet our Heavenly Father invites us to turn back to him and ask for his forgiveness. Heavenly Father, 
We confess that we are by nature sinful and have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. On account of Jesus, forgive us, renew us, and unite us to your name. My friends in Christ, Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die and rise for you. In baptism, you were united to Christ in both his death and resurrection. You were buried with him, but also raised to walk in newness of life. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are dead to sin, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We join together in the hymn of praise. with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. May all who are baptized in his name, faithful in their calling as your children, and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, One God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated as we hear God's word. The Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. 
And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives for God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. Now John was clothed with, clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of, Ga Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So before we sing this hymn, I need to let you know that um, I had chosen this hymn because of the words. The words tell the story and the, the theology and the importance of why Jesus was baptized. I couldn't find another hymn that told this story any better. So I chose the hymn. The problem with the hymn is it's one of those hymns that's called a guam for short. Those of you who know music and especially hymnody know what a guam is. The word guam, G-W-A-M, stands for great words, awful music. And I mean awful music. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to ask Eunice to play it once through so we can get the hang of it with just the melody. And then I would ask her, there's three verses. So then I said, Eunice, please play the melody once. And then when we sing the first and second verses, just play the melody. And then on the third verse, by that time, we'll know it like we know, you know, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, and we can sing it with a full accompaniment. And I was prepared to go with that. And I was prepared then to say, send your email complaints 
and to me and phone me with your complaints. Don't phone Eunice. I chose this hymn. So then Eunice this morning says, but pastor, Rudy, I have an alternative hymn tune for that tune, for that hymn. I said, what is it? And she told me all this before the early service. I completely forgot. And I said, you do what you are going to do because I think what you will choose is going to be way better than anything I've got for this hymn. So sure enough, when you hear the hymn tune she's going to play for this hymn, you will thank her on the way out because the hymn choice that I had was a Guam. And so we need to, th so she made me this offer. Um, and so she, she's now made me an offer essentially I couldn't refuse. So when you see Eunice now, please realize she's in the same company as most mob bosses. And if you watched The Godfather ever, you know she made me this offer I couldn't refuse and now I'm in her debt. And so I'm going to tell all of you and, and the people watching the video that I made this promise to her, to the people at the early service, and you are my witnesses. I'm going to take her, because she offered this, and I owe her big time, I'm going to take her out for lunch to one of her favorite places called Prairie Inc. Um, and I'm going to buy her lunch, and I want you to witness that. And you can hold me to that. Um, and uh, we'll just, after COVID is over, um, we're going to do that. Am I right, Eunice? Do you have time for that? Can you make time for that? Okay, thank you. All right, I'm sorry about the personal little thing there, but trust me when I tell you, um, thank Eunice for picking that tune. All right, let's stand and sing our sermon hymn. <laughs> Grace, mercy, and God's peace be unto you in the name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. The text is from the gospel that you heard a moment ago. Please be seated. Well, my friends in Christ, this morning, as I mentioned earlier, we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. The day our Lord Jesus Christ stood before his cousin John in the Jordan River and submitted himself to the baptism of of John. So, it's a bit of a chronological leap. Those of you who love movies, if you were watching this as a movie, here's what would have happened. We had the birth of Jesus, 
And then we celebrated the Epiphany, which was about three or four years after his birth. And now there would be a, a, a little note at the bottom of the screen. It would fade in. It would say, and now 30 years later, and then it would fade out. So there's a bit of a chronological leap between last Sunday, which was Epiphany, and this Sunday, which is the baptism of Jesus. All kinds of other things happened in his life, but we don't have a record of those, except his time at the temple with the, with the, the rabbis, and that time where Jesus you know, got lost in the crowd and they had to go find him and all that. Um, but here we are, 30 years later. And so we get to think about Jesus in this um, baptism. And so when Jesus ends up in front of John, John, his cousin, is outraged. John says, no, Jesus, you've got it backwards here. I need to be baptized by you but you're coming to me. That's upside down, inside out, and totally backward. It's not how a respectable Messiah is supposed to behave. But Jesus answers John with an incredibly telling sentence that explains exactly what's going on in this baptism. Let it be so now, John. Let it be. Let go of any notions you might have of who I am or how I'm supposed to work. <coughs> Pardon me. It is fitting, proper, the right thing for us to fulfill all righteousness. I, Jesus, get baptized like a sinner. I become sin for you for all these people in the water with me, and for the world. That's how all righteousness is fulfilled. The sinless Son of God is baptized as a sinner to fulfill all righteousness. Not only to comply, but rather to obey. To fulfill obedience to the law. Not just a passive compliance, but an active obedience to following under the law. The sinless one becomes our sin, so that in him, baptized into his death, we might become the righteousness of God. You see the, the great exchange? It happens on the cross. God puts on himself our sin. And from the cross flows his righteousness. And the same thing happens in baptism. God takes upon himself in Christ our sin in the water and gives to us and exchanges with us the robes of his righteousness. His sin, sorry, our sin for his love, his love for our sin. His baptism is, as a sinner among sinners takes him, and this is how it's connected to the cross of Calvary, where he dies bearing the sin of the world in his own body. For this, he is anointed with the Spirit, visibly and tangibly, and approved by the Father who sent him. This is the Father's delight. God the Father delights in his Son doing this work. That his sinless Son should stand in solidarity with sinners in order to save them. Remember when he died? The temple curtain was torn in half. It's the same way that the heavens were at his baptism. Here it is finished. It is accomplished. All righteousness is fulfilled. Baptism brings the cross and all that the cross will bring to bear upon him. And here's where the rubber hits the road. People always ask, Pastor, make your sermons come alive to me. Tell me how I relate to them. Well, let me do that. 
you and I are steeped in our sin and God's law condemns us. There is no way for you or me to save yourself. You can't do that. Nor is there any hope that you can improve beyond a bit of superficial rehab. We are all born in Adam's and Eve's sin, and we are held captive to it. We're born as a prisoner of death that turns our lives and us into the formless and the void. Dust, the scriptures say, we are. Sin is our Lord and our master by birth. And no matter how free we may believe ourselves to be, the fact is that we are truly held captive to sin and cannot free ourselves, even if we wanted to. Wow. Are you depressed yet? Are you glad you came to church to hear this bad news? Here's the good news. This is what you came for. For this Christ came, was baptized, died, and rose from the dead. He was baptized into your sin and mine so that you might be baptized in his righteousness. He was baptized to become the sinner in this world so that you might be baptized as a saint in his kingdom. There it is. The good, the great gospel news of this day. He was baptized to become the sinner in this world so that you might be baptized and become a saint in his kingdom. Awesome. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. That's Paul. By the waters of baptism, by the word that is attached to baptism, don't ever overlook that. It's so easy to overlook the water. Baptism is the active agent here. We focus in the Lutheran Church on Holy Communion. But the other sacrament of Holy Baptism is just as rich for us today. Part of the reason is that we Lutherans, we were baptized when we were little children, infants. Most of us, several weeks old, maybe a few months old. And we don't remember it. We don't have a clue what happened. All we have, and yes, we have them, is pictures of our baptism being held by our mom or our dad. And when we review those pictures, every time, the kids always say, well, mom and dad, you sure wore funny clothes. And your hair was weird. Because that happened so many years ago. And every time I look at baptismal pictures, the clothes always look funny. It doesn't matter what the clothes were. What matters is that baptism happened. And we have witnesses and godparents who tell us that they were there on the day of your baptism. You were baptized into Christ. And anyone who says that baptism is just some symbolic religious ritual needs to run by the verse I just wrote, wrote, read. By baptism, we were joined to Jesus in his death. We were buried with him. Sin is drowned in forgiveness. Did you catch that? Sin is drowned in forgiveness. What an image that is. The pouring over water, over sin, unto death with forgiveness. And you through the water and the word and the spirit are born anew. Born from above a new creation in Christ Jesus, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, you too might walk in newness of life. There it is, a new life, a new creation, a new you in Jesus. 
Paul goes on to say that our old self, the old Eve, the old Adam, was crucified with Christ so that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. We have been declared legally dead to sin. Your baptism is the death certificate of the old Eve and Adam. I wish I had come up with that sentence. I didn't. Some other pastor with way more depth of theology than me came up with that. Let me read that again. Your baptism is the death certificate of the old Adam. As far as God is concerned, you are legally dead to sin but alive to him in Christ. Now mind you, this is forensic. An act of God's word, a judgment laid on you and it was declared by God, so it is. Just when, like when God said, let there be light, there was light. Him declaring it makes it so. Now here's the thing. Your old Adam and your old Eve, they are both very much alive. But now, they are to be daily drowned and mortified. Drowned in forgiveness. And as a new person in Christ, the new you, who you really are in Christ is to daily rise to live before God in the righteousness that God has given you in him. God declared it so by his word, and therefore it is. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ, to God in Christ Jesus. <coughs> That's what it means to live baptismally, to live as one of those baptized by Christ. You must reckon yourself to think of yourself daily and constantly as dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Yes. Yes, 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 you do sin, and so do I. It's true. We are still the old Eve and Adam in the flesh. But as Paul reminds us, and please understand this, that's not you doing it, but the sin that dwells in you. And some would consider what I'm going to say a curse word, but I mean it in the biblical sense. Drown that damn thing in baptism. Today, you choose, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to drown the old sinful self. No power in you. It is, after all, what we learn in the Catechism, the Holy Spirit, which calls, gathers, and enlightens you to choose to drown the old sinful self. Remember your study of the small catechism? The explanation of the third article about how you come to faith? Remember, I cannot, sorry, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. What happens when you start thinking about your sin, though? I think about my sins, my failures, the things I should have done and the things I shouldn't have done, my sins of omission and commission. And boy, it can weigh you down. You start thinking about those things. It's pretty oppressive, and it becomes a terrible burden. So, how did Luther deal with his burden of sin? 
He wrote this about that. When your sins bother you and oppress you and cause you to doubt because they do, we can say with Luther, enough. I am baptized. Enough. I am baptized. And in that remembrance and that moment, we think of the water of creation's deep. We are reminded of the baptism of Jesus. And we're reminded of our own baptismal waters. And the word that was attached to our baptism. It is so easy to overlook, to diminish, to make some less of it than it actually is. But when water and word and spirit together watch out, because incredibly great things happen. The heavens are torn open. The Father approves. The Spirit descends. Life and life are spoken. A new creation has come. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Did you get that? You're in Christ. You are a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. The question becomes, how do you really know for sure? How do you know you're in it? How do you know that you are in Christ? And how do you know that you have the Spirit and the Father's approval? How do you know that heaven is open to you? It's not a feeling. Because feelings come and go. It is the reality, the objective truth that you are baptized into Christ. How do you know all those things are true? You are baptized in Jesus. Amen. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in him forever. Amen. Let's stand as we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have revealed your Son to us in the wondrous epiphany in the Jordan. So also you have revealed your name and blessing to us in holy baptism, declaring us your beloved heirs. Grant that we may daily die to sin and rise to newness of life, living with joy as your baptized children. Lord, in your mercy... Preserve your holy church here and scattered through the world. Give steadfast faith to all Christians by the preaching of your word and through this holy sacraments and send laborers into your harvest. 
Enliven the love of your saints to bear one another's burdens and to show mercy toward those outside of the church. Quicken us in the hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, preserve our nation, its leaders, and those who serve for the good of our people and for their protection. Grant peace in our time, O Lord, for you alone fight for us. Lord, in your mercy, give comfort and relief to those who are sick, depressed, tired, confused, or in any need. And here we remember your servants, Bill Bishop, who is ill at home, and Lorraine Beliski as she continues to recover from her fractured wrist. Lord, in your mercy, at your invitation, O oh Father, we come to your supper for rest. Preserve us from impenitence and unbelief. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness and clothe us with the righteousness purchased with your Son's blood. Lord, in your mercy, Lord God, Heavenly Father, you manifested yourself with the Holy Spirit in the fullness of grace at the baptism of your dear Son, and with your voice directed us to him who has borne our sins, that we might receive grace and the remission of sins. Keep us, we beseech you, in the true faith. Since we have been baptized in accordance with your command and the example of your dear Son, we pray you to strengthen our faith by your Holy Spirit and lead us to everlasting life and salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from the eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the same night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Our Father, We join together in the annual stay.
The congregation may be seated as we sing on pre-distribution hymn. Please take a moment to read the screen for the reminders about the procedure.
Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. Now may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in joy and peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction and blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We join together in our closing hymn. may be seated. So once again, we want to welcome all of you to our worship service and again extend a hearty welcome 
to those and thank you to those who are watching the video. How many of you remember a game show called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Remember that? Okay, so um, in that game, there were three options. If you didn't know the answer, you were able to pull the audience. Um, you could call a friend, and I don't remember what, oh, they removed two answers or whatever it was. But I'm thinking about the phone a friend option. So what we want to do at Faith is this morning and for several weeks already, we've made a PDF available of the directory of the church. Names, addresses, phone numbers, emails, cell numbers, those kind of things. We're printing, we've printed out a number of copies. You can pick one up, one per family, please. Um, so that you, we want to invite you to phone a friend. Um, somebody you know from the church or me heck, maybe even somebody you don't know just to keep in touch with them socially. You never know what a difference you will make by calling somebody just out of the blue. Um, it's really important to do that in these times. So that's available now. And then speaking of those kind of things, we want to be able to help our people, especially our seniors. We're going to have, we always have before COVID, we had the seniors' luncheons. Everybody would gather in the narthex. We'd have a wonderful meal and a lot of time for socializing. We want to do that via Zoom. There are instructions in the bulletin for the 21st of January where we're going to have a Zoom call for our seniors. More instruction later. Dennis, I want to call on you for your announcement, please. The uh, Board of Directors met this past Wednesday and one of the issues we dealt with was the planning for our annual meeting. Our original plan was to hold it on February 7th on Sunday between the two worship services. However, now with there being a hard cap of 30 people per any gathering, it wouldn't work to have it uh, that way. So what the Board has decided, taking into account the fact that we actually have 163 people on our voters list. Historically, fewer than half of those usually show up at annual meetings, but nonetheless, both our Constitution and the Not-for-Profit Corporations Act require that organizations uh, ensure there's capacity for all eligible voters to participate if they wish to. So this is our plan. On Sunday, February 7th at 2 p.m., we will have a concurrent Zoom and in-camera meeting. Uh, almost all organizations are holding their entire annual meetings by Zoom, and uh, we do hope that a very high percentage of our members will be able to do that. We are going to organize and present some educational activities that help people understand how to use Zoom if you haven't yet used it. It's really quite easy. It's very much like FaceTime or Skype or things you might have already used for interaction with your kids or grandkids. So then at 2 p.m. we will commence the Zoom meeting and at that time we will allow 30 people to gather here for an in-person meeting. So in order to protect the space for people who quite genuinely don't own a computer or an iPad or a cell phone, we would ask everybody who does have such a device to try and learn how to use it before the 7th, and then the people who don't have that device will be physically present here. There are um, ex an, a written explanation of that on the table. Please pick up one as you go. Mark your calendar for February 7th at 2 p.m. Thank you. All right, please follow Lorraine's direction as you leave the church. Remember to do the physical spacing. Go in peace and abide and shelter in Christ.